Hey, thanks for joining me. Here's some DM tips for Chapter 4 of Vandelver and Below, the retelling of the original starter set adventure, really good adventure. And we're into Wave Echo Cave now, and the characters should be 4th level. When they come to Wave Echo Cave, this place is about 15 miles east of Vandalin, and it lies deep in the vales of the Sword Mountains. The rich mine of the Vandelver Pact was lost 500 years ago during bandit attacks that devastated the area. In the century since, countless prospectors and adventurers have searched for the lost mine, but none succeeded until the three Rockseeker brothers found the entrance a month ago. And the party in Kragma Castle finds a map, Gundren's map, that takes them to Wave Echo Cave. The features of Wave Echo Cave are important. This place has one big bad. They kind of like to be the climatic battle, but as it's kind of free form in the adventure, that's going to take a little bit of maybe uh, massaging on the DM's part, as much as the DM can or should. Uh, one thing that can help with that is what's going on in the mine itself. So this place has this booming wave sound happening, and it's coming from a distant location when the party first enters the caves here in location number one, and it's to the northeast. There's also a noticeable breeze that blows to the northeast. So I actually drew that on the map here, this not noticeable breeze. So the idea being that hopefully the party will be pulled in that direction, and if they are pulled in that direction, then there's a good chance they'll go through a lot of the adventure before they find themselves at the spider, at the ultimate encounter. Now, if a party's got really good trackers and such, when they come to this first location, there is the dead body of one of the, one of the Rock Seeker brothers, and the party could search for tracks, and, you know, truth be told, the tracks should lead them basically due north toward the spider. Assuming the party doesn't go that way, they go the other way. Let's look at what encounters they have. We have this first encounter, which is just basically a search encounter to find out, you know, the, the Rock Seeker brother, and he's got uh, a cloak of protection on him. So another magic item there for the party. And then if they head east, they'll come to this intersection here. Well, if they go north from the main area, they'll come into the mines. The mines are six feet tall, so kind of um, claustrophobic. You can play that up as you're running the adventure. They have partially excavated rock faces. There is an ochre jelly. There's this cool picture of an ochre jelly from the adventure. And I put this token here that I made for the ochre jelly. I'll put a link to it in the description below so you can grab that token that I made of that guy. And he can be really anywhere in these mines, wherever you want to put him. I put him by default along the path the party could take straight to the spider. So if the party's going to go that direction, you can put in a few things to try and slow them down and maybe redirect them. But uh, so yeah, so I put him in that location there. Now, if the party goes east, they're going to come to this intersection here. And at this intersection, there are you know a bunch of dead bodies. These bodies are 500 years old, so they should be mostly bones. There are some sturges hiding up in the ceiling that'll attack the party. No treasure there. Then the party might come down south here, and if they come to this chamber to the west here, this will be odd in that the bodies aren't skeletal, which should indicate the party is something dangerous. Uh, amid the ruins, the remains of dwarves and ogres, and you can play up that they are fleshly remains. The stench is overwhelming here. This is a really difficult fight with two ogre zombies in the chamber. Those things hit really hard. Let's take a look at how hard these guys hit. So a Morningstar attack from one of these guys is 2d8 plus 4 damage. That's a uh, Pretty solid, and I even multiplied it a little bit. I multiplied by 1.2. I wouldn't recommend doing that unless your party's really experienced. Now, if the party fights and defeats these guys, they could come over here to the other side. And if they do, you could find some treasure here in the Assayer's office. From there, if they keep following the breeze, they'll head east into this really beautiful, beautiful cave. And this, this map here, I should say, is done by Heroic Maps. I'll put a link in the description below for this. This is Lost Mine of Vandelver, Chapter 4, Wave Echo Cave, DM Resource Pack. They have this amazing map, which really ties the adventure really well. Um, there are extras in there as well, like what you might find on the corpses of the long-dead wizards, random events that might happen in the mine, things to kind of flesh out the dungeon experience. And then they also have the top-down tokens by Devon Knight. Very nice-looking tokens. Then the adventure is, of course, coming from... I'm taking it from D&D Beyond, way back to cave here. I, uh, I've taken to saving these, saving these PDFs. You can go to print in Chrome and then uh, print to a PDF, and I save them because Wizards is starting to change these around, and maybe not necessarily for the better all the time. Then we have tabletop audio, and there are a couple of songs I used, or a couple 
sounds I use for tabletop audio, one being Lost Mine, I think made specifically for this adventure. Let me turn that on so you can hear what that sounds like. Lost Mine, crank it up. So there's Lost Mine. And then another one, as the party gets closer to the lake, you can throw an underground lake. So that's the uh, music I used for the adventure. And then you have James RPG Art has some uh, really good art pieces. Here is the ruined entrance to Wayback Cave. So I put that, I think you probably saw it when I looked at Area 1, right down here. And he does these gifts too, so they actually are animated. See the grass blowing, the clouds going by, uh, various birds flying around. So it kind of brings it to life a little bit. All right, now to this cave here, there's a couple of uh, violet fungi that the party could run into. So in area eight, on the description of the area, I have them make a DC 15 nature check to know more. And if they'd make that check, they are gonna learn, yeah, they've got some violet fungi there. They can avoid them if they stay along the south wall and along the east wall. From there, they come to, well, actually let's go up the central spur. So we were going around the eastern spur and any time the party might divert off and start going up north. But if they stay with the, uh, with the breeze, they keep going around. So, but let's look at what happens if they go. We come to area, well, first through area two, through the mines. Then area six has some ghouls in there. The doors into area six are actually slightly ajar. So they might see them partially open and then they might go listen to them, hear the crunching sounds. And then if they push forward, face the ghouls in the chamber. Area seven is just basically a ruined storage room. And that could serve as maybe a location where they could rest up. Then we have the gigantic cavern in the center of the chamber. And this one's got some ghouls hiding up on the northern shelf here. And it has, of course, dead bodies all over the place. Then if they were to come up the western route, let's look at what they would see there. So if they search and they decide, hey, we're gonna follow tracks. You can make the DC pretty high, but if they find it, you should let them find it and decide if they wanna follow it, they should be able to follow it. They head north, you can ambush them with that ochre jelly. And then they can keep going north. Of course, in this chamber, they're going to ambushed by the giant snake that is in the pool of water. There's not much really to indicate to the party that they should search that pool. Should they fight that giant snake? Uh, that would mean they'd leave behind a wand of magic missiles if they'd ever search, which would be a shame. But if the party's coming straight due north and you need to slow them down, you could have them when they're fighting that giant snake, which should come up behind the last of them. Hear a bunch of voices of bugbears and see the door cracking open and they might retreat if they hear that, or they could fight on. And if they fight on, you can have the bugbears fight them, uh, maybe have a couple of the bugbears fight, and then say, go get reinforcements, and a couple get away to the north, and then maybe the party will retreat. But if they push on, what is likely to happen is if the bugbears get reinforced, you know, you got a grand total of, what's that? That's six, 12 bugbears, and they are tough. And then you got the spider himself, you got the, uh, doppelganger, which I just used a rogue for the a drow rogue for the doppelganger. Uh, the party could very well get captured, and that's okay. The party gets captured. I use that. That's what happened when I ran it the first time, and I used it kind of as an opportunity for the party to come back and try to rescue the party members with the various NPCs they brought into through the adventure. Then, if uh, they get all the way through, they'd go to the spider. But let's go back the other direction. So let's say they're going up the northern or the central passage. Next thing they could come to here is this smelter. And this is a pretty tough encounter. This is a flame skull and eight zombies. And flame skulls are really dangerous. Now you could telegraph this quite a bit. You could have them see the flame skull way out here floating up before it even sees them. Uh, use your judgment on that when you should reveal the flame skull. Because basically they probably will retreat and go a different direction if they see it from a long way off. Okay, then if they go up the eastern spur, you're going to come to this starry cavern. You can see the beautiful maps here by heroic maps of the starry cavern. This is where the Forge of Spells is at. This is where the worst spell battles were fought in the battles 500 years ago. You have this area over here, which is the uh, wizard's quarters. And there's an undead wizard there, Mormesk the Wraith, who will try to confront the characters, speak in grave whispers, tell them their presence is offensive to me, their life forfeit, and give them a chance to run. If not, attack them. Okay, I got more mask here. And uh, I'll put this token, of course, there for you to grab. A uh, beautiful token of a wraith. He's going to come out, confront the party. This is one 
the, like the only location that the heroic maps didn't match the adventure exactly. The adventure talks about a closet back here being all destroyed and a chest being in this main chamber that the party could take. I just made a area 14A and put the chest back in the back chamber here, and that'd be what Mormesk is guarding. Then you have this is all one big chamber, the starry chamber up to the north here. There is area 15. These doors are all kind of hard to open. I should put a marker by them. I do that often when I have doors. You can see it right here, crunching sounds. As a reminder in the DM layer for me, when there's something outside of a door that I should remember that the party has. So I'd put both of those doors there, there, and this one up here being difficult to open. But if they come to the Forge of Spells, they can be confronted here by a spectator. And you can call for an Arcana check to see uh, who in the party might know that that green forge is the main power source of this location. And that's how magic items are crafted. If they overcome the spectator, and they can do that by tricking it or just overcoming it, then they do a search here. They'll find the Mace Lightbringer and the Breast Dragon Guard. Dragon Guard and Lightbringer, a couple really cool magic items here that they can find. Then come over here to area 16, and this is where they'll see where the place gets its name. Wave Echo Cave, the great ocean out there, or the great booming cavern out there. A octopus that can drag people into the water. Then you have a short little tunnel here that's only four feet tall, going what used to be an old riverbed, old stream bed. Then you come over here to where some bugbears are kind of excavating down in a rift that it's recently opened up in the place. This collapsed cavern. You can see that the waterway used to go straight across and used to go down this passage there and power the water wheel down there in area 12. Now, four bugbears again is pretty dangerous, and there's a doppelganger hide, hiding out, which I turned into a drow, and I also used the drow with a pistol. That drow can be hiding in the shadows there such that he can retreat and warn the spider should anything happen. Hopefully, the party will be coming to the spider at the end of the second session. That is how it ended for us. We were uh, in the first session captured, had people come... Uh, NPCs come, including the druid, to help the party. And then finally, all together, they killed the spider. And that was the end of this part of the adventure, chapter four. In the original adventure, that was the conclusion. And you can lead the party to think that that's the conclusion this time as well. They have avenged the murder of Thardin, Rockseeker. They defeated Neznar, the black spider. They rescued Nundro, Rockseeker. They cleared Vandalin of the ruffians who terrorized it. They reclaimed the lost mind of Way at Echo Cave. And they're hailed as heroes. Then chapter five starts. And we'll pick that up with the next DM tips. Thanks for watching. If you have any suggestions from when you played it, leave them in the tips below. And I will see you next time.